electricity. Silent, invisible, efficient. It touches our lives a thousand times a day, runs the machines where we work and the appliances where we live, prints our newspapers, lights our signs, controls traffic, saves our lives. Public power made its debut in the 1880s as the miracle of electric power spread throughout the United States. Even before Thomas Edison's Pearl Street Station delivered electricity in 1882, two public power systems in the Midwest had already lit their courthouse squares using dynamo-driven arc lamps developed by Charles Brush. In March 1880, Wabash, Indiana, the country's first municipally owned electric utility, lit up its courthouse dome, and in December 1881, Butler, Missouri, lit arc lamps which could be seen 20 miles away. More public power towns followed, Fairfield, Iowa in 1882, Danville, Virginia in 1885, Bay City, Michigan in 1886, Alameda, California in 1887, and Jamestown, New York in 1891. By 1900, 344 municipal utilities had been established in the United States. This expanded to 678 by 1910, 979 by 1920, and 1,167 by 1930. Today, there are more than 2,000 public power utilities. come out here to protect the interests of the American people in their own electric power resources. I want to emphasize that these power resources belong to the people of the United States and not to anybody else. During Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s, as the federal agencies cooperated with municipal power utilities through grants and loans, public power saw a boon with the creation of water resource and hydroelectric power projects. As the private power companies began likening these efforts to creeping socialism, the possibility of a national organization to fight for public power in Washington took hold. In 1934, E.F. Scattergood, general manager of the Los Angeles Bureau of Power and Light, and Morris L. Cook, the first administrator of the Rural Electrification Administration, tried to organize a national municipal utilities association. The association ultimately failed after Scattergood became occupied by other issues in Los Angeles. However, the necessity of such an organization increased as the country geared up for a possible entry into World War II, and public power was seen as a major ally in defense production. Brought together by Scattergood, Federal Power Commission Chairman Leland Olds, and REA Administrator Boyd Fisher, 41 representatives of municipal and state power companies met with various federal agencies in September 1940. Forty of these representatives then broke away at a luncheon to convene the first meeting the American Public Power Association. Boyd Fisher was then named the first general manager of APPA, but left a few months later after disagreements over the management of the organization. In 1941, Loop River Public Power District in Nebraska sent its manager, Harold Kramer, to manage APPA during its organizing phase. Though he left the next year to make way for the first permanent general manager, Carlton Now of REA, Kramer helped to create the organization's management process starting the Public Power Newsletter to keep members informed of issues affecting them in Washington and help prepare members for changes necessary for the war effort. 
now, for his part, created Public Power magazine and fought multiple attacks from private power that at the time was likening public power to socialism. There was this intense competition and they had one ad which pictured a concentration camp and they equated public power with socialism, with communism, that sort of Nazism. Through the next six decades, APPA saw only four changes of leadership. Alex Radin in 1951, Larry Hobart in 1986, Alan Richardson in 1995, and Mark Croissant in 2007. These APPA general managers and presidents saw the organization and its members through the rise of nuclear power and joint action agencies, the creation of new federal bodies overseeing the electricity sector, new environmental and conservation regulations, and the restructuring of the power industry. APPA has been able to go to the Hill, send a uniform message. It's not going to make us all happy all the time, but at the end of the day, every one of their members, whether they're big or small, realize that we got to stay together cooperatively.
you think about what a trade organization needs to do well, that, that doesn't really change. I mean, you, you want to be an effective advocate for the issues that are critical to your industry. You want to mobilize, in our, in our case, the grassroots that symbolizes and constitutes our strength as an organization and as a community. But, you know, I don't think that changes. Now, the, now the way you do that, you know, the, the way you reach consensus, and maybe the way you communicate with your members, um, the way you adapt to changing times, I mean, that, you know, that, the kinds of activities that we engage in may look a little different in the future. But in terms of what we have to be good at to be successful, how we define our basic mission. I don't see that changing a whole lot.